we're trying as nutritionists to meet that requirement by what we put into the diet. But actually, we may be creating more problems than we're doing good because we're not allowing these physiological processes that occur during pregnancy to actually respond. By over-supplementing the calcium phosphorus, we may be shutting some of those mechanisms down. One of those would be the remodeling of bone and the turnover of bone mineral to meet the fetal needs. We may not need to put it in, in the diet, allow the animal to use that, and that may actually help the sow by turning over the bone. Welcome to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine nutrition research digested for you. I'm your host, Clayton Chastain, and today we are back with Dr. Tom Crenshaw. He is an animal science professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. If you're just listening to this and you haven't listened to part one of this series that we have with Dr. Crenshaw, I would suggest you go back and listen to that one first because we will be picking up from where we left off um, from our conversation that we had last time. Um, So we're going to skip the introduction period and jump right back into where we left off. But Dr. Crenshaw, what are some of the concerns of overfeeding phosphorus? I know this is not something that people always consider because typically they just want to make sure they have enough phosphorus, especially with how cheap phytase is. As long as there's enough, then it's usually fine. But physiologically to the animal, are there any consequences to overfeeding phosphorus in sows? Yeah, that's a concept that I think uh, most of us in the nutrition area would think, well, excess phosphorus should not be a problem. The body's able to handle that to regulate, you know, kind of the calcium and phosphorus. And we have homeostatic mechanisms where the body keeps things in a steady state condition and simply eliminates the excess. Uh, If it's phosphorus, in that case, that's absorbed into the body, uh, the kidneys would still be the site of that excretion. But there are uh, intrinsic values or a term that I've used to these. These are physiological um, responses that the animal has. And these responses explain a lot about why we see differences even in the digestibility of phosphorus uh, at different stages of gestation. And those responses as the models that we have that would allow us to predict requirements are kind of a linear function. Uh, they're assuming as the pig, as the fetus grows, based on the composition, we need to put more phosphorus uh, into the diet, calcium and phosphorus into the diet. So we model that. And as the animal grows, we're trying as nutritionists to meet that requirement by what we put into the diet. But actually, we may be creating more problems than we're doing good because we're not allowing these physiological processes that occur during pregnancy to actually respond. By over-supplementing the calcium phosphorus, we may be shutting some of those mechanisms down. One of those would be the remodeling of bone and the turnover of bone mineral to meet the fetal needs. We may not need to put it in, in the diet, allow the animal to use that, and that may actually help the sow by turning over the bone. And we know that from uh, studies that have been done uh, decades ago that uh, in, in most of it was actually in rats, but if the bone is turning over, that actually is beneficial and prevents a lot of the problems we see uh, even in human health uh, with osteoporotic kind of conditions and going through lactation cycles. So there's benefit for the animal to cycle these physiological mechanisms up and down. When we put excess phosphorus in the diet or excess calcium and phosphorus in the diet, and that ratio does become important, and they are quite critical in there. But uh, we shut down a lot of those mechanisms that would occur. But also, we um, stimulate the release of a hormone that's uh, very, we know very little about that, even though it was 2005 when that was first uh, recognized and discovered. Uh, in the animal sciences area, we have not really been able to fully use that. It's a hormone FGF23, fibroblast growth factor 23. It's a peptide hormone that's produced in the osteocyte. That's the cell that's embedded in the bone matrix. And uh, that cell releases a hormone in response to excess phosphorus. Think, okay, that's just the way that the bone is responding to the excess phosphorus. But that hormone actually targets the kidney and it does two things in the kidney which is to the benefit now of the animal. It actually increases the excretion of phosphorus in the urine. So there's excess phosphorus. The body's trying to get rid of the excess phosphorus. FGF23 is released from bone. 
targets the kidney and increases the uh, excretion of phosphorus in the urine. The other thing that it does, I think, is, is quite important to understand in the mechanism of what we try to do with animals and where we may be actually compromising our sows, especially, is the FGF23 actually shuts down the activation of vitamin D. 25 hydroxy D, which is a form of vitamin D that we measure in circulation, that everybody wants to you know, make sure that we have serum concentration to 25 hydroxy D that are adequate to meet the cell's requirement. That 25 hydroxy D has to be converted into 125 dihydroxy D. That's the active form that has uh, responses in the animal. Well, FGF23 actually inhibits the enzyme that does that conversion. So we can have circulating levels of 25 hydroxy, but that 25 hydroxy is not being converted into the active form when there's FGF23 that's been released from bone in response to the excess phosphorus. So we might assume that we have ad adequate vitamin D status in the animal, but in reality it's not being activated into the active hormone. So that can be a consequence, and we it's a very difficult um, response to measure because the 125 hormone is actually a it, it's a hormone. 125 hydroxy D is more like a hormone, and it's at uh, 10 to the minus 12th to 10 to the minus 15th in concentration, and it fluctuates up and down in the body, much like other reproductive hormones that. We as the audience might be more familiar with those that we have to measure, need to measure that at 15 minute intervals in order to have a true status of the animal. That's very difficult to do in, in a production setting, certainly. Uh, and so if we're not activating that, the body may not be regulating calcium and phosphorus like it should because of the excess phosphorus. So that's a consequence of the excess phosphorus that we still are trying to work out and understand um, how the body's respond into that excess by keeping it at an adequate or even a slightly low level, those uh, mechanisms will allow the body to work, allow the cell and hormonal uh, secretions by the cell, FGF23 being one of those, parathyroid hormone is another uh, hormone that's involved in calcitonin that would respond to calcium uh, responses. All those hormones have to be in balance and the body will respond to what we put into the diet. And I, what I see occurring most commonly in the industry is we overfeed the animal as nutritionists, and I put myself in that box, we tend to overfeed the animal because we're trying to provide the needs of the animal but what we put into the feed. And in this case, we may need to work with the animal to allow the animal to respond and use the nutrients that we put into the feed with a greater efficiency, which goes back to the over supplementation of phosphorus. If we allow the animal to work with us, they're using the phosphorus more efficiently and making an improvement on that. If we go back now to the phytase, let me mention that just briefly. If we go back to phytase and how much phosphorus is released from the phytase, and then what we do with the calcium phosphorus ratio and how that responds, um, as I said, I was wrong about phytase. It works, okay, in the uh, early mid-90s. I said phytase would never work, and, okay, I was wrong about that. It does work, uh, and certainly a lot of evidence for that. But I think there's a lot of responses that we don't fully understand and tying in these intrinsic responses, the hormonal responses of the animal, and how they respond to even the calcium phosphorus ratio and what we put in the diet. I think it's critical for us to understand that maybe more so than us trying to work out uh, the digestibility values of all the feed ingredients, the var variable feed ingredients that we feed, and we try to work that out and determine a digestibility value for each one of those, and then that's different for different phases and different stages of production. Um, I'd like to say, you know, if we take that approach or continue on that approach, and I've forgotten my high school math, I think that would come in, there's either permutations or combinations of all the ingredients we feed at different levels with different combinations. Uh, you would have, I don't know how many studies that we would need to do to work out all of those different possibilities. Um, I, I guess we could summarize that and say, well, what would you call that? I'd call it job security. Okay, if we can, if we can do that, uh, that would certainly be job security, but I think that would be 
there's an easier way to do it, and I'd like to you know try to propose something here using the uh, urinary calcium phosphorus ratio as an easier way to predict whether we're feeding a diet that's adequate for the animal. And then as those ingredients vary from batch to batch or source to source, and you don't have time to determine a digestibility value by the time an ingredient comes into the feed mill, it's used up before you would get the results back from that. But if we could collect a urine sample from that feed, turn that around and know whether or not the herd is being fed that's using those ingredients of that batch of feed, we could turn that around and then predict whether or not we're feeding or make an adjustment while that uh, batch of feed ingredients is still in the bin or still at the feed mill. So I think a rapid way to do that is where we need to be, uh, that's where we're going with some of our research. We want to propose uh, using urine calcium and phosphorus and validate that that's a accurate way to predict adequacy of phosphorus, certainly not deficiencies, but that we've got an adequate level. And if we can minimize the excess, we save feed costs, but we also reduce the concerns for environmental pollution. Giga Technologies manufactures just all swine precision feeding systems, designed by a family of pork producers for pork producers. The just all feeders are a simple, durable, and reliable solution, trusted by industry experts for all production stages. For 30 years now, Giga Technologies has been at the forefront of innovation, continuously enhancing sow nutrition and delivering remarkable outcomes for producers. Contact Giga Technologies specialists to learn more. Gotcha. So based on some of the things that you've seen with that calcium and phosphorus ratio, do you think that needs to be tested more um, on like an individual farm level or are there are certain trends that seem to happen based on geographic area or genetic lines? Well, it, it could be all of the above, but I think, you know, certainly on farms, it depends on, I think, on how often a particular operation might be changing feed ingredients. I mean, if it's corn, soybean meal, synthetic amino acids, and you know single source of phytase and there's a fairly steady state of those ingredients going through but if the farm is changing and using a variety of ingredients when those ingredients change that would be the time to actually go in and reassess on a few cells you don't have to if there's a 5,000 cell operation certainly don't need to collect the urine from 5,000 cells but developing a rapid way of collecting the urine, and we have some, you know, certainly some ideas on that, I would, would not be proposing this. And also a way to do a more rapid analysis. Uh, the analysis, what I'd eventually like to get to, we're not there yet, but it'd be almost like a litmus paper, and you could just simply take a urine sample, dip a uh, piece of litmus paper in it, and know whether that sow is being fed an adequate or deficient diet. Or it might be, we've all experienced this now in, in recent years, the rapid COVID test that we had to take. So we take a saliva sample and we put on this little uh, strip and we know whether we have COVID or we don't based on the rapid test. So that test has not been developed. We can do in the lab, we can do the mineral analysis and determine calcium and phosphorus. We're working on a colometric assay that would be easier, make that easier to do. So if we can get that test, the rapid turnaround on that, it might be even something that on some farm levels, think about what we do with um, you know, some of this more sophisticated equipment now that we have for semen collections. We might actually be able to have the equipment at a farm site that could do on site uh, the urine calcium phosphorus ratio. I think if we can, I think we can work out a procedure that would do that without without having to send something off to a lab. That's you know just a problematic. So rather than send it into a lab, we're doing it on site. Gotcha. Yeah, it sounds like you have your work cut out for you when it comes to trying to make a way to make all this research be applied in the field. Um, but thank you again, Tom, for coming on the show and sharing all of this research you compiled over the past years with us. Great, great to uh, be a part of this. Really appreciate the opportunity to kind of get our message out and talk about some of the things that we're doing and some of the things that we're dreaming about doing uh, still into the future. But knowing where we're going uh, with this, uh, maybe uh, people in the audience may have suggestions, feedback, and certainly be very willing to do that. And if they can send me an email, that's probably the fastest way to, uh, to contact me. So. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you. And thank you to everyone else for listening to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt podcast. Please visit us at swinenutritionblackbelt.com. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast channel so you won't miss out on the next episode. See you next week.